for all of us, we all need something to fight for. We need something to believe in. And I think being mission centered right now is ever important, especially in the fitness industry. I'm finding, hey, we've made four, five new hires in the last six months alone because we're attracting people who want to gather around the mission to change and transform lives. And if you've got a strong mission, people are attracted to a mission. But if you're kind of lost and you're out there and you're in your company or your career and you don't know what you're doing, people don't like waffling for too long. We all want to be part of the mission. Welcome back to another episode of the Todd Durkin Impact Show. And folks, I am so fired up today. I have one of my best friends on the show. Miss Trina Gray is here. Trina, all the way in Alpena, Michigan. What's happening, Trina? Oh my gosh, it's a beautiful August day here in Michigan. And I have been excited all day to sit down and have a conversation with you because I know that we'll get some golden nuggets out there to your audience and people looking to um, improve their lives. This is the place to be. Well, I can't wait to dive in. Before we do that, folks, um, Trina and I share a lot of commonalities. Today, we're going to talk business. We're going to talk parenting. We're going to talk life and lessons and, and joy and happiness and what's bringing us the harmony that so many people desire. Matter of fact, we try to excel in all areas of life. I want to, I have a question for all of you. Do you ever feel sometimes when you're trying to achieve quote balance, like how do I get balance when I'm trying to be an entrepreneur, a, a leader, a coach, a trainer, a parent, uh, and you're just trying to do everything. Well, when you try to excel in all areas of your life, uh, we're gonna talk about that today and the, the myth of balance, but how do you find harmony and joy? Matter of fact, Trina is a, a repeater here on the Impact Show, episode 14, episode 14. Folks, we're in the <laughs> 200s right now. We just celebrated our two year anniversary way back in the beginning. I think it was like, I don't even know, it was early. Uh, on Grit, Grind, and Dreams with Miss Trina Gray. And uh, if you have not heard of Trina Gray, if you've not met Trina Gray, um, I've known Trina since 2007. And um, we've uh, been part of my mastermind group together. She's been a tremendous contributor to the mastermind. She has been a huge part of Idea World Fitness. Um, she owns her Bay Athletic Club in Alpena, Michigan, which folks, if you're ever in Alpena, Michigan, check it out, by the way. It's worth the trip to go to Alpena just to go to BAC. It's unbelievable. And uh, she's an amazing mom to her 18 and 16 year old kids, uh, Jaden Colt. And when I say we have a lot of commonalities, um, as we record this, she's just days away from bringing Jay to the University of Michigan to be a Wolverine. And I know Trina, you're gonna talk about that um, because the wave of emotions that I'm going through right now, uh, practically with tears in my eyes with, with Luke over on the, on the East Coast and, and Jay getting ready and Colt who's 16, a high school football player over in Michigan. Um, I'm so excited to share today you, but bring me up to snuff with everything that's going on in your life. Uh, any backstory I missed, because you are an amazing woman coaching so many people uh, to higher levels of fitness, wellness, high performance with what you do with Beachbody. Bring me up to snuff in a quick version before we dive into all the details. Oh, well, I love it that thank you for that. We do have so much in common, Todd. I think that, um, you know, just the fact that our families have things in common and our kids are in similar stages of life. Um, also, both of us just being really, um, you know, driven entrepreneurs who love passing it on to other people, right? That's, I guess, a big part of who I am is I, I like to have a fire lit in myself. Yeah. But I really like to light fires in other people. So um, I live here in northern Michigan. The, the town, as you mentioned, is called Alpena, Michigan. I have had several visitors, people I've met through the mastermind group, through here even this summer. Um, it's a beautiful part of the country. Uh, my fiance, Aaron, has three young kids, ages four, eight, and 10. My two kids are 16 and 18. So Todd, we've got a busy household here. We love it. We live on the lake. We pedalboard. We um, tube. We jet ski. We um, 
wakeboard, all the things. Got two little dogs and my daughter's got a cat. So it's a fun, bustling, busy household. Um, the kids are active, fun, respectful, great kids. And um, as you mentioned, I run two clubs, Bay Athletic Club, and then our training studio is called Bay Urban Fitness. Super proud that they have weathered the storm Amen. of the past couple of years, which we can discuss a little bit. And then separately from that, I coach a lot of women coast to coast all over the country, um, mostly women in fitness who want to also branch out online. And I do that with a platform from Team Beachbody. So those are the things that bring me joy. That's what I'm doing right now. That's kind of what's happening in my life. Kids are getting ready to go back to school. We've had an amazing summer up here. Um, and I'm happy to sit down and chat with you today. Wow. Awesome. Awesome background. And folks, when we, we go into this, I definitely want you to follow Trina and all that she's doing because she is someone on her social media and all the different platforms that she uses is literally radiating light, igniting <coughs> light into the universe. So the last 18 months, uh, the fitness industry, heck, all industries have been impacted greatly. I know as an entrepreneur leading dozens of people in your business, brick and mortar at Bay Athletic Club and Urban. Um, uh, tell me about just a few of the lessons um, that you've learned because you're in the you're in the trenches. You're still teaching class with our coaching that we do. I know you're still literally teaching the group X. I know yeah. you're in there leading your team. Tell yeah. me about a few of the lessons that you have learned. Yeah, well, I love hearing, you know, what makes me happy is the fact that you and I can be sitting here in, you know, August of 2021, talking about our businesses still thriving. They've been through bumps. They've been through valleys that it's been tough, but I love that we're still here showing up in the fitness industry, showing people that it might look different, but we're relevant. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Our communities need us. Our members and clients need us. Our teams need us. Right. So that's in itself, just a cool thing. Um, a few lessons, Todd, three quick lessons that I feel like I've learned in business. You know, over the past 15 years of owning clubs, but really more specifically in the past year and a half of all the mandates and changes, right? Number one is just being willing to make a decision, make it quickly and move forward. And it sounds so simple, but there's so much angst, anxiety. I see you smiling. Like those of you listening right now, Todd smiling. He's like, I get it. There's so much angst, anxiety, worry, um, hand wringing around decisions in business. Do I let this person go? Do I cut my rates right now? Do we bring people back distance mass? Do we just go virtual? Do we, there's so many decisions we've all made as owners, right? right? right. And my suggestion is to trust that there's more than one way. And that the decision you make is good enough if you've made it sincerely with some thought and you just put it out there quickly and you own it. Yeah. I made a lot of decisions in the past year and a half about programs I was keeping, cutting teammates, I was putting on unemployment, people I was keeping on, hires I was making, changes on my team, going virtual. If I made a laundry list, it'd be a laundry list of decisions. The efficiency of the decisions is what I'm proud of. Not all the decisions were the right ones. Some of them could have been, you know, a path diverging in the wood. I could have picked either one, but I made the decision. I owned it with confidence. Mm. So that's tip number one. Have you in the last year and a half, like me, everything that you put out, when you talk about making quick decisions, every text, every email to your community or on social media, you've got to look at it like three, four or five times. What am I saying? Because I'm going to get blown up because I don't know, y'all are laughing right now. I can, I can see you out there in your neighborhood's walking around laughing is because I don't know about you, but I've developed even thicker skin the last year and a half. You get to a point where you're like, you know what? This is what I believe. There's going to be people that hate me and love me for the exact same action step that I take. And I'm going to do this the best that I know, whether it's right or wrong. I'm not going to worry about people think because half the people are going to love me and half the people are going to disagree, or at least a few people are going to disagree. And where do our heads go? They go to the three people that think that you should do it this way instead of that way. And I'm just laughing because... I know in the last year and a half, it has taken me more time and energy to do one post or one email going over the same thing three, four times saying, okay, am I going to really polarize anyone with my thoughts uh, on that? I mean, Todd, that just, you know, it's a perfect segue into my second tip. So I 100% agree with that. I'd say that the efficiency and ownership of your decisions for you note takers out there make decisions efficiently and own them without a ton of extra explanation, right? Mm -hmm. Just, 
All right. And trust that there's more than one way. And in this day and age of so much change, one decision is not necessarily better or worse. Just making the decision is good um, and often good enough. Number two, then to go with what you're saying is communication has been really the source of success for me in the past year and a half. Um, it's also a source of angst, as you know, because not everyone's going to agree, but I'd say that communication has been the source of my success in my business. So simple things, going live to my community, going live to my teammates, getting on Zooms with my teammates, doing special um, social outings with my teammates on Zoom often, talking to my community authentically, honestly, transparently, pulling back the curtains and saying, this is what we're dealing with right now. We're working on reopening under these circumstances. This is what we're bringing back. We need you you need us. Mm. And I repeated that a lot, Todd. Mm. We need you. We want this business of 15 years to be here still. We need you. And I was honest saying that. And then I said, but I know that you need us. Social isolation is a real thing. Turning into a couch potato, getting out of your routine is a real thing. Mental and physical health is a real thing. So I kind of made it like this silent pact. You stay with me, we'll stay with you. Mm. And I feel like the communication to my membership and clients, um, I feel good about. That doesn't mean they liked everything, but I was honest, transparent, and kept this symbiotic relationship of you need us, we need you. Well, that's that's leadership, by the way, Trina, right? That's, that's leadership is the communication. And I find that leadership is probably the hardest these days than I've ever seen in my 25 year history in leading people, why? Because what you're talking about with communication is connecting and connecting people, your community, your team on this is, <laughs> there are days when I wish to myself that I didn't care as much as I do. But sometimes I try to make everybody happy. Yeah. I'm like, I can't make everybody happy. And the more you try, those two, three, four people sometimes like, man, you just can't make them happy. So leadership in today, is so critical on all, by the way, all industries, right? Can I get an amen, all you people who are listening in, regardless of your industry, your your career. But what Trina is talking about is communication is key. And I think one of the things with communication and leadership is listening and really listening to your team, listening to your, your community as Trina is talking about is how do you listen? How do you listen with your eyes as much as your ears? Because leadership today is also understanding people's personal struggles as much as their professional struggles because of the climate that we live in. And again, back to it is you've taken on an extra role. Certainly a communicator. I mean, I think that we're leaders and entrepreneurs, business owners, trainers, whatever you may be out there. But in addition, part of that role is certainly a communicator. And maybe that hasn't been your strength and you got to make it your strength. The communicating to the to the um, clients, as I explained to you, is being authentic, honest, telling them what was happening, yep. um, asking them to stay with me, I'll stay with you. Communicating to my team was having them trust, mm. having them trust that I got this. Yeah. Now, I don't have it perfectly, and I need you alongside me, but I got this. And I felt like just letting them know that we're relevant, we're innovative, we're, we've got a slight edge on others. Like, I really feel like I did what I could to let the team know we got this, right? I had a lot of changes on my team in the past year, Todd. And as you know, uh, any of those Enneagram listeners out there, I'm an Enneagram three, an achiever with a wing to a two, a giver. Givers are also very emotional, right? We want to give, but we really want to feel grateful for what we've given. Um, and so any of you out there who get that, get, get me. And I feel like I made a lot of changes in the team. I had to let some people go. I had to make some new hires. I made some bad hires under the gun. Right. I made some hires I shouldn't have made that we then had to regroup from that caused more friction than anything. And it was just being willing to make decisions, move on, forgive myself, move on, communicate, move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we talk about this. It, uh, I've got a smile on the inside because leadership and, and leading when you're not always sure the answer is what you just said is your team wants to believe in you. I think for all of us, we all need something to fight for. We need something to believe in. And I think being mission-centered right now is ever important, especially in the fitness industry. I'm finding, hey, we've made four, five new hires in the last six months alone because we're attracting people who want to gather around the mission to change and transform lives. And if you've got a strong mission, people are attracted to a mission. 
But if you're kind of lost and you're out there and you're in your company or your career and you don't know what you're doing, people don't like waffling for too long. But when you're mission centered like you are, Trina, and I know many of the, the teammates on your on your staff, um, we all want to be part of a mission. I want to be part of a mission. You want to be part of a mission. You want to change lives. You want to make this world a better place to be. And I think you do an incredible job uh, being mission centered. By the way, not only a BAC, but also with what you do with your coaching, with all the ladies you coach. Um, you just had your live event, which I want to talk about later on because yeah. you had a live event with a couple hundred people. And folks, I saw your social media blowing up like Trina Gray has an army of women down there exercising, training, laughing, smiling, hooting, and harm. Like, I want to be part of that right there. <laughs> and I've always admired that about you. Um, but the thing about leadership, it's it's ongoing. It's every day. It's it, is ever, it is every day. It's not a hat you get to hang up. I was thinking about the, the mission part that you brought up and part of the, I guess, opportunity struggle. They're all the same thing, right? Um, in the past year, it was finding teammates who still want to be part of the mission, but maybe in a different way. Maybe they had changes in their personal life. Maybe what I could offer them at the gym wasn't what they had before. Maybe it's not what they wanted in the same way. I had a lot of that. Uh, the gym was changing, roles were changing, jobs were changing, but I was able to keep some key people who want to be part of the mission. I wanted them to be part of the mission, but they could be part of the mission in a different way. Right. And so recognizing your business is going to look differently. It's going to have different renditions over the years. COVID, no COVID. Your business is going to have different renditions and you uh, need to be a chameleon with it and recognize that your business can be successful looking a lot of different ways. My third quick business tip, Todd, this one's pretty um, easy, but also a relief for people out there. I'm about to offer you some relief. If you need to make changes in your business, this is the time to make them without having to offer a lot of explanation. We're in this kind of sweet spot of life that people are so used to rules, things changing, services changing, you know, now it's takeout, now it's carry out, now you can sit down, now you can't, now, you know, whatever. People are so used to change right now that, listen, take that red pen to your business. What do you want to get rid of? What hasn't been serving your base? What hasn't been serving your bottom line? What are you not passionate about? Listen, you don't have to bring anything, everything back. So we're in this space right now, Todd, in the past, you know, nine months, especially of I am protective of this house of, B, of Bay Athletic Club, and I'm not bringing in a product, a service, a boot camp, a training. I'm not bringing something in that I can't wholeheartedly get behind right now, and I don't have to explain why. That's wow. like giving you permission to make changes you need without a lot. No one questions when you get on an airplane now. No one questions. Okay, you have to wipe your seat down. You have to put a mask on. You can't, you can't stand up. Like There's just certain things you can't do now, and like that's just what you do. Folks, mark that tape. Go back, rewind it, and just keep playing it over and over again. You have a blank slate. You have a whiteboard. You've always complained about certain aspects of your business, either or where you work, where you own, where you lead, whatever it is. Now is the opportunity to change what needs to be changed. Wait, yeah. you got to raise rates? What? Raise rates? In the middle? Yeah. Maybe yeah. now is that time to do those things that scare you. Because yeah. why? If you're offering a great service, regardless of what service that is, now's the time to say, this is the life that I want to design. I'm yeah. going to design my life the way that I want it to be over the next few years, knowing that there'll be more change that's going to come, but I'm right. going to do it under my my command and how I want to live my life. Trina Gray, yeah. that right there is a mic drop moment. Thank you. I want to give credit to, uh, I took that idea, Todd, and ran with it in my club, hearing Mark Fisher two years ago, right in the heart of the pandemic. Mark Fisher, a guy out of New York, amazing guy, said to me, if you've ever wanted to make change, you have this, he called it this um, uh, kind of this moment in time to make change without explanation. And so I took that to my business and looked at everything in it. Some things had to change because of COVID. Other things didn't have to change because of COVID. Some staff needed to change, some didn't. I could make whatever changes I wanted knowing yeah. you don't have to over explain right now. Yeah. And it's just this sense of freedom that you can look at the opportunity of change that like, I, I'm not bringing this program back and no one's gonna question it. Yeah. You right? Mark, Mark's a brilliant man. I love always speaking with him. And, you know, speaking of brilliant, the other guy who's brilliant, uh, Andrew Simpson, fellow P10 mastermind member, said something at our live meeting a couple months ago here in San Diego. He said, make decisions that are reversible. And I like that. Like, make decisions that are reversible. Like, if you wanted to change the decision that you could, in essence, change that in six months if you wanted to, or in three months or 12 months, 
make decisions that are reversible. Andrew Simpson, another great leader that a while back also. Trina, if you were to, to wave a magic wand and look at the fitness industry in the next one to three years, what do you see a few of the opportunities coming up as? Oh, that's so good. Todd, I honestly feel like the future of the industry is how I have seen the industry myself in, in the past few years. And it just happened that with the changes that happened um, in our world with people being more remote and virtual, I've always thought that a combination of live fitness, some kind of online accountability, whatever that looks like in your life, whatever kind of app or service you want to use, doesn't matter. I've always thought that so many of the decisions and many trainers and, and those in the industry believe this too. Um, but I've always thought that so much of people's real health, mental and physical health happens outside of our clubs. And so we're so narrow. We've been so narrow. If our only impact with that person, although impactful is that they come to your, so I teach a Saturday morning strength class, Todd, I teach a Sunday boxing class, like they're fire. I love them, but I recognize that this one hour impacts their day, impacts their mood, but it wanes throughout the week. Right. And then they need another boost. And so assuming that, that people make a lot of life decisions, nutrition, fitness decisions outside of our four walls, we have to be more relevant in their daily life. So some kind of online coaching, virtual coaching, connection outside of live sessions is 100% where I think the industry needs to be as a whole. That's fitness, that's nutrition, that's mindset, so much of what you believe in and offer and just you know coaching the whole person and not requiring everybody to always commute to our facilities to be with us live, even though I 100% stand behind live, real, person to person, you know, there's nothing to me that can replace that energy of a group, but it can't be the only thing. And that's how I feel. It can't be the only thing we don't, we're not competing with online fitness or at home fitness. We got to join hands with that and say, I want to be part of all of it. Mm, powerful. I believe that as we navigate this very interesting time that we're in, I know that the health, fitness and wellness industry are really going to have some amazing bright days. A lot of dark days in the last year and a half. And for every for every valley, there's a mountaintop. And one thing that people have really come to grips with is that their health is the most important thing because without that, we've got nothing. I know that the next year to five is going to be tremendously valuable for those coaches and trainers who really do want to make a difference. Those who want to pour into lives and change bodies. And whether one's expertise is in training or flexibility, mobility, massage therapy, and touch is going to be huge because people haven't had the ability to be touched um, like they need to be. Recovery. The recovery world is going to shoot through the roof because of the stress, anxiety, depression that is rampant right now and will get worse before yeah. it gets better. So those who are willing to serve both in a brick and mortar facility, online, delivering programs through stream, uh, on demand, live, however it is, I believe the most gifted healers, trainers, coaches, therapists, uh, instructors who have that desire to change lives and help people, that our fitness industry is going to be well positioned to change a lot of lives because there's going to be a lot of lives to change and positively impact. So uh, that's yeah. my belief. Right. I mean, we, we both believe, Todd, that fitness isn't a hobby. That it's not, it's not a fad that's going somewhere. It's, a, it's an actual essential need. Right. And so if there's ever, like, if you've got listeners out there, Todd, I often meet people in the industry and I bet you do too. They come up to us at conferences, they message us afterward. And they're like, I have my certification or I have my degree, but I've never done anything with it. I'm calling you out right now and saying, you know what? You've got a certification. You have a passion. You, you have a desire to help people in fitness. Start, go help people in fitness. It's never going anywhere. It's the industry I would, I would bet my life on. It's the industry that will send my kids to college. It's the industry that I will retire in because it's not a fad. It's needed. It's, it's the other end of healthcare, right? Prevention is the most important thing we can get behind. I don't want to just get behind acute care. I want to be in prevention and wellness. And I know that your listeners, many of them out there do too. Yeah. Simon Sinek talks about uh, in his uh, Start With The Why that your what and your why may not change, 
in most industries have changed. And guess what? Your how of how you deliver your services, whatever your services are, are probably going to change. I don't care if you're a police officer, if you're a physician, if you're an attorney, your you're how you're delivering meta, wait, telehealth? We're actually having appointments on telehealth these days. Who would have thought that a year and a half ago? How you deliver your services will change. But why you deliver them? I want to change lives. I want to impact lives. I'm going to get people's bodies, minds, and souls transformed. Years ago, I didn't think I'd be doing what I'm doing, how I'm doing it right now, including virtual live, you know, virtual keynotes to thousands of people right here from my office. I never thought that. Trina, perfect. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Speaking awesome. of, you just said that your, you know, your your daughter is going to college, right? You have kids at young ages. I want to shift our hats. I know going through this, having two teenagers yourself. Talk about parenting right now. You have a lot of entrepreneurial demands and responsibilities, but you also have a great responsibility, your two kids. And I've known you for a long time now. And one of the things I most admire you and respect you for is how you show up for your kids and how you've used your business, how you've structured your time and your energy so that you could be there for your kids. Talk about some of the lessons um, that you can pass on. We got a lot of parents that are are listening in right now. Some kids are young, some are older, some yeah. are, are don't have me yet. But talk about that because you do it extremely well. Well, I'm I wanted to shift and be able to talk about excelling in both business and parenting because honestly, Todd, I was just at a conference um, in right outside of LA in a beautiful part of California, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Um, this beautiful resort, and a gentleman came up to me there. Somebody I've known in the industry, in the fitness industry, for a long time came up and said, I have a really important question for you. I assumed it was about business because we're at a business retreat, right? And he said, I've always watched your journey as a parent. My kids are younger than yours. Tell me your tricks. Tell me your lessons. Tell me what you've done. What a fun topic, right? So let me just, of course, disclaimer here. No one's a perfect parent. It doesn't exist. I'm not a perfect mom. I lose my cool. I make the wrong decisions. Sometimes I misunderstand them. There's all that. But in spite of that, Todd, I've got really amazing kids and I want to share three quick stages of parenting and just really specific tips that work for me as a parent that I feel it could serve your audience. So one is, is having, when I had younger kids, right. When they were, let's say elementary school age, one thing that we wanted to pass on to them was work ethic. And so all you entrepreneurs out there and business people out there feeling the guilt of, Oh, I'm a working mom. I'm a working dad. Okay. Use that to your advantage by showing them work ethic at a young age. Here's two ways that I did that. I always talked to my kids about my business goals. All right, you might not think to talk to your elementary school kid about your business goals. I did. I told them several times I was working on hitting some goals to take us on vacation. I was working on some income goals, um, some projections for my online and, and my live coaching business. I would tell them, This is what I'm trying to hit. This is what I'm trying to do. This is how it'll help our family. I got my kids behind my businesses and behind my goals. I included them in both my Bay Athletic Club business and my Beachbody business from a young age. They were a part of it. They knew who was involved in it. They were a part of the family business. The other thing I did at that age to teach them work ethic was that we had the ability, and some of your listeners might too, to do great things for my kids, Mm -hmm. right? As entrepreneurs, we work hard, but we all also want to play hard. My kids have traveled the world at a young age, but I wanted them to know that there's work behind it. So before we took them on any vacation, I could think of one in particular, we took them to Universal Studios to Harry Potter World. They had to earn that trip alongside of their parents. So they had charts, they had to either read chapters of books, do math worksheets. There's a a number of things they could do to earn these trips. At the time we bought tickets, you can buy them like on Amazon, just like tickets you get like a lottery ticket or a ticket you get at a fair. And they had to get 25 tickets in their jar before the trip. So they loved the idea that they were working on this trip as we were working to earn the income and the time off for this trip. It's one of my favorite lessons and one that I pass along to my friends with kids that age. Mm, that's good. That's good. Work ethic and doing great things for your kids and not feeling guilty about it, by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know whenever we've done some big things, I'm like, wow, I didn't have this when I was a kid and making sure they knew that I didn't have the opportunity to travel to Europe when I was a kid. Heck, we couldn't get in an airplane to afford that right. back in the day. So uh, work. Ethic. And I want my kids to enjoy what we've been able to provide for them without the guilt attached of like, you get this, I never got this. I want them to feel like 
they're a part of my business. They're a part of what I do. Yes. They are aware of what it is and they're working alongside of us for trips. So I thought that was fun. The tickets or the charts these days of like putting stickers on a chart. Then, okay, let's progress a little bit. Kids in junior high. This is where it gets tricky. If I've got any junior high parents out there, um, I feel yes, your pain. Awesome. Okay. Your kid is in eighth grade now. It's right. Different. Interesting ages. Okay. Interesting age. And so here's what I say as a mom who's been like really involved in my kids' lives through junior high. This is what I did. Simple tip. And I know it sounds basic, but so much of life is communication and I love communication. So I made a point. Now my kids are going to listen to this podcast and be like, that's what you were doing back then. <laughs> um, listen, I love you. And it worked. Okay. So back in these like very pivotal years of sixth, seventh and eighth grade, I conversed with my kids kind of in the same tone, in the same way on topics that were simple and easy and topics that were hard. So unlike where maybe how you grew up or how I grew up, you know, a difficult topic was so awkward. It was like all this buildup. I need to talk to you. We're going to have a serious conversation tonight. Like you're worried before the conversation even happens. Mm -hmm. So parents, maybe we're talking about grades. Maybe we're talking about friends. Maybe we're talking about choices. Maybe we're talking about drugs or alcohol. Maybe we're talking about their peer group, right? I tried to make my intonation, my voice, my body, um, the way I acted, not nervous yeah. on different topics. Like I could be talking to my kids about what they're going to have for lunch, or I could be talking to my kids about alcohol at parties. And I tried to talk the same way mm. and really remove the buildup or the drama or the unease around it. And that's not to downplay those topics. That's to say that we can talk about any of these things and I'm going to be here to listen and talk and not bring you all this angst around something you probably already have angst around. So parents, you want to talk to your junior and your high kids about social media or things that they're going to hear in the bathroom at school or stuff they're going to hear at the cafeteria table, words and things you don't want them to hear about. You have to be able to talk about it like you're talking about what they had for lunch. Mm -hmm. Your ease around the topics make them feel ease around talking to you. And I'm telling you, Todd, that was one of the better things I did. I felt like in junior high was the ease of communication around all topics. Love that. That is good. You find that your kids, they go to you for specific topics and their father, Jeff, for different topics? Or do you find that they can go to you for anything and Jeff for anything? Yeah, I'd say in the junior high years, first of all, dad, you know, Jeff's a very engaged dad and an awesome dad, easy to communicate with as well. But I would say that in the junior high years, maybe it was just the idea that I generally was the one picking them up and, and driving them. And there's that key car time where I also found that I could have really great conversations because you're not looking at each other. And that kind of takes away a barrier for kids. I know this sounds so simple, Todd, but it was a lot easier to talk about what happened at school, good or bad, when they don't have to sit across from you and talk to you when they're sitting next to you. I think that in the junior high years, my kids would probably say that they talk to me about the more difficult topics, the, you know, issues with friends or bullying or yeah. whether it was a sports team, athletics, whether it was, you know, I, I feel like we had a little bit more of that time or connection, um, but certainly both of us incredibly supportive. Um, I feel like that was something that we talked a little bit more about. Um, yeah. Another tip with this idea of communication is one thing that I was just sharing this with a friend the other day. Um, I think my kids would tell you that I stuck to this rule for myself, that if they brought something to me that was a challenging topic or something that they may have been struggling with at school or with a friend, I let them bring it to me on, on their terms. And I made the kind of mental rule that I wouldn't go back and badger them about them or ask them about that. That once they released it and shared that with me, I would give them my thoughts on it, I'd give them some direction, but I wouldn't the next day be like, well, whatever happened with that friend? Or are you still mad at that teacher? Or whatever happened? They wanted to know that they could bring me things without me owning it then. If that makes sense. That's good. That's good. Man. Yeah. So parents be willing to communicate. Now, listen, my kids listening to me like, it went well. It didn't always go well. But the general rule, I think they would agree for sure is that, I try to communicate smoothly and easily about topics that, that wouldn't bring angst to them. And that if they did bring me something, I wouldn't hold it against that friend of theirs. I wouldn't hold it against that person. I wouldn't, well, you didn't like her last week or something happened with her last week. I try to let things go as they let things go. Whereas parents, we kind of want to hold grudges or, you know, hold on to things. And our kids are going to move through a lot of struggle. Let them move through it. 
So Trina, are you saying that you did not try to like fix them when they were in middle school? No, I know that's such a hard thing, right? I really felt like I tried to give my kids the ability to talk about things. If they needed my help with it, I would. Mm. But Todd, for the most part, they're ready to deal with things on their own with some guidance and not be the helicopter parent in junior high trying to fix everything for them. Yeah. Right. And so it's it's hard. Like these, this one is junior high one is hard, but I really feel like the ease of communication, the letting them come do with things, you know, and some of this comes from, you know, the parenting that we had growing up and, and I have good parents, but I recall when I was growing up, not the ease of communication, mm. not the, that, that hard things were very awkward and difficult and were very serious. And that was not easy to talk about. And so that turns into kids who only talk about the good things because that makes their parents happy. I wanted my parent, my kids to be able to talk to me about whatever it was, whether it's happy, sad, or otherwise, they weren't going to, I'm not going to hold it against them. Right. Mm. So yeah. Okay. Let me move quickly into high school years. Uh -huh. Whew. This is a big one. And I hope that it can serve some parents out there listening. The best thing I could do for high school age kids was this one lesson. And it was so strongly shared with them that I want them to make choices that reflect the life that they want and not make choices to reflect what they think makes me or their dad happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's what that means. I'm a parent that would choose for my kids to not use drugs and alcohol in high school, but they're gonna be presented with a hundred opportunities along the way. Mm -hmm. I need them to make choices for themselves and not out of fear of getting in trouble. That if they choose to avoid those things in high school, that they're choosing that because they have a path for their life that they see and that doesn't fit it. Mm. That is such a better reason to, it also goes along with grades, okay? This is so key with grades. You probably want your kids to do well in school or to put in the work and get some good grades, all right? Most of us would say that we want that for our kids. I don't want them to want good grades for me to make me happy. Right. I want them to get good grades to make themselves happy. That's their choice for their life. Right. Parents, it's such a difference to have kids performing to please you versus performing to please themselves. Mm. Powerful. What I say to that is this, parents, why do we protect our kids so much from making mistakes or losing? What? What the hell are you talking about? Middle school or high school, one of the things I've always said is when when one of our kids loses the game, I don't mind the losing aspect and I'm not going to sugarcoat things when they lose. I actually think it's a great lesson because everyone wants to win. Everyone's, you know, they feel good and, and that awesome. I love winning as much as anybody. I want I want to win. I want my kids to win. I want people to experience winning, but I also want them to experience losing because when my kid says they want to go to this college, they want to go to that college, they have this dream or that dream, but then if they're on the Snapchat or TikTok for four hours, that's not going to match up with where you want to go. That's called choices. And the choices have to parallel, have to match up to what your goals, dreams, and visions are on that. I think in high school, to your point about choices and whether it be, whether it be partying, drinking, uh, sex, whatever that is, choices have consequences. Make good choices, good things happen. Make bad choices, ultimately you get burned. You choose. It's your choice. I'm going to hopefully steer you in the right direction, but I can't be at the parties with you. I'm not going to be at the parties with you. We're not going to do all the things that, that you're going to do. But if you make the right choices, ultimately, good things are going to happen. So make the right, right choices. That's and I want them, Todd, to make those, and all parents see this differently, right? But I really want my kids to make those choices for them because they're the ones living with themselves their whole life, right? And so I, I, I really wanted to get away from the feeling of, um, when you get that good grade, you please mom and dad. When you get that, when you um, avoid that party, you've won with us. No, you've won with you, Yeah. right? You've won with you. And so that's that's one thing I'd say. So it kind of covered all different ages and stages of life. I hope that's been helpful. Any of your listeners have questions on that or thoughts on that or ideas on that. I do sometimes share parenting ideas and thoughts on my Instagram, Trina Gray. Um, I'd be happy to hear from you guys on some of those tips if you're interested in, in chatting more. Yeah, well, Trina, you do an amazing job, both balancing your business interests along with parenting and all that you do. What would you say in order for you to live your best life as a busy mom? You're busy as anyone. Everyone listening in right now is busy. You've got your podcast on and you're working out or you're working or you're driving somewhere and now it's an entrepreneur. 
What have you found to live your best life as a mom, as an entrepreneur and all that you do? What are some of those lessons? Yeah, I love finishing with this, Todd, because we talked about business. We talked about the kids that we're raising, but let's not forget to talk about ourselves. I'd say that the few lessons that I have really um, grabbed onto, held onto in the past couple of years, especially, has been the idea of moving through struggle faster in life. Hmm. Part of that is just personal growth, personal growth journey. Part of that is just saying the struggle is going to happen, whether it's relationships, whether it's separation, whether it's moves, whether it's job changes, family struggles. Listen, listeners, I know that you know it. All of our struggles are different, but we all have struggles. Hmm. And so my, my goal has been to move through struggle, transition, or change faster. And to know that I'll feel the struggle of whether it's work or a relationship or a family issue, like to feel the issue, but to not dwell in it because I don't want to dwell in this like cesspool of a pond of stale water. I want to move through it. Right. So I try to see, yeah. How? Because I, I feel like you can't, you can't put it under the rug. All right. So you feel it. You feel all of it. I'm not scared of my emotions anymore. I'm not scared to feel scared or lonely or hurt. I'm not scared to feel sad or worried. I feel like part of this um, came, you know, came from some podcasts I listened to, came from some books I read, where the, one book in particular called Untamed helped with this concept of feel all the feelings. The life is meant to be felt. So by experiencing heartache or pain or loss or sadness or happiness or success, when I feel it, I felt it and I'm really much more able to say, okay, I felt the sadness or I felt the pain. I felt the joy move on. Mm. And it really is that simple. So here's why I wasn't moving on in the past, or maybe your listeners aren't moving on. They're pushing all those feelings down. They're shoving them under a rug. They're pretending that they weren't hurt. They're pretending like they didn't have frustration, pain, or worry. They're pretending like that thing didn't happen. That worry never happened. So it's just always sitting in the back of their head. I bring it to the forefront. I feel the feelings. It's kind of like I've unwrapped the gift, I've looked at it, and I move on. Mm. Mm. This is good. These are life lessons. Before we move on, because I want a couple of your life lessons because they're always so prolific, I want to just stick with this for a while because I feel that the, the topic or theme of adversity is huge these days because we all have adversity and move on. Um, do you use self-talk? as part of your way to move on. Is that something that you use? Or I'm, I'm more intrigued on how, how do you, you're, you're facing a difficult time or you have an employee situation or you have a pending surgery coming up. You have something that's fairly big. How do you move on? What, what is it that you do? Or is it, I'm not gonna hold on to it. I'm gonna give myself three days or a week and I'm moving on. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate that. One, I'm not afraid to communicate about it. Right. So if I have a struggle with a friendship or with a relationship or a struggle with my kid or a struggle with work, I really make myself communicate about it, even when it's hard, even when it's not well received, even when it's difficult. Like I just feel like most things in life can be fixed with communication. Right. If both parties are willing to have a conversation, communication. So I make myself have the conversation, have the communication. Um, and once you can do that, you can agree to disagree, to use that cliche, you can see things differently, you can still, you know, be upset by what happened or whatever, but you still are able to move on. I love it. And so I'd say to, I'd say, Todd, communication, conversation, being willing, being somebody that doesn't always have to be right. I enjoy being heard. I enjoy hearing others. It's, it's a struggle when, you know, to be able to let go that like, I don't need to be right. I don't need to be right. I want to be heard and I'm okay not being right in their eyes. I'm going to move on. That's so good. So good. Your communication, direct, taking it head on is a great way. Melanie will laugh at this because she knows it's about me. I haven't shared it much, but being the youngest of eight kids. So in the past, I've, I've sometimes shied away from those tough conversations because I hate when I walk in and something doesn't feel right. The right. culture doesn't feel right. Something's not right. And I'll I'll try to avoid it because I don't like dissension. I've off, often, when it comes to this topic, when it comes to 
things, you know, adversity or struggle, I'll use the, the old embrace the suck. Like I've got to address it now, otherwise it'll be a bigger problem. And realizing sometimes you're gonna go through tough times and I'm built for this or I'll use, I use a lot of positive of this is how I'm gonna navigate my way through it. And when looking back, each and every one of you, when you look back in your life's biggest lessons, typically came from a time of pain or going through adversity or something you had to deal with or a negative situation. So um, those are some of the things that I'll use, realizing that even though I like peace and harmony all the time, oh. I've got to take things head on, even if it's uncomfortable doing that. Otherwise, it'll fester for weeks, months or longer. And that becomes a major problem. That's yeah. good. And that's the that's the strategy is move through the struggle faster by addressing it. That doesn't mean always being confrontational. That doesn't mean always being argumentative or authoritarian. I'm not I'm not saying that. I, I found that to be kind of off putting myself. The idea is, can you have conversations that need to be had? Can you work through communication? And then and then knowing that you're you're gonna be okay. Not all friendships last the test of time. Not all work relationships last the test of time. You're not going to always stay in the same job. You might not always live in that same home. Like you're going to be okay. And I think that in terms of positive self-talk, Todd is telling myself like, I'm going to be okay. That's good. That's good. Next lesson. Yeah. Okay. Different one. So think about this, depending on the age that you are, maybe the stage of life that you're in, I'm in my forties, I'm in my mid forties, I'm 45. And I can say that self-care in my life looks different maybe than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I feel like giving your listeners permission to, to look at their self-care and to take it more seriously. And I feel like these days I really value my sleep where I feel like I spent my thirties sleep deprived. And I get part of that as kids and work, but part of that was just me deciding I'm going to live sleep deprived, right? So for these days, I feel like, nope, I'm better when I have good sleep. I'm better when I'm doing recovery. I'm better when I do yoga every day. I'm better when I take a walk every day. I'm better when I'm unplugged. I'm better when I shut down social media for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I'm better when I feel like I, my value is not always everything that I produce, but just who I am. And I feel like I just have more of a sense of peace around myself that my value is not just productivity. I know I can be really productive. My value can be found in quiet moments as well. Quiet moments with my family, unplugged time, quiet moments with myself, going for a walk isn't a waste of time, yoga, meditation, um, just self-care, sleep in general. I just have a better sense about it. Wow. Trina, thank you for sharing that about you because as I've seen you grow as a woman, gosh, well, you were in your, you were almost maybe 30. 30 when I met you, yeah. So to see you uh, mature in that way, because I see how great care you take of yourself now and not feel guilty about it. Folks, maybe as you're listening to this, you think about or you even journal in your notes section, your phone or in an actual journal, I call it your WLWB, when life works best, what are you doing? WLWB, when life works best, what are you doing? Those things that Trina just mentioned about sleep and yoga and walking, paddleboarding, unplugging from technology and social media, family time, dinners, then how do you double down on that? How do you spend more time on that? Well, you structure your calendar and schedule to do that. And Trina yeah. is a living example when you say, well, how did she do this? She has structured her calendar now because I've known her for a long Absolutely. time. More times than not, you're taking care of yourself and right. uh, putting yourself in a situation where you have the energy and the vitality to then go serve your team or to go serve uh, those who you coach um, in Beachbody and all of that. So um, uh, folks, don't ever feel guilty about self-care. I've been talking about this for a year and a half about Amplify your self-care, have extreme self-care. Trina is talking about this for herself, what she does uh, for her and her family and those who she works with. Uh, Trina, that's a very valuable lesson. Uh, any more life lessons you wanna share? Last one quickly is just that, I sometimes think people confuse self-care in terms of, for me, it's been a bit of a slowing down, a bit of a taking more deep breaths in life. And I mean that literally and figuratively, but like, doing meditation, doing yoga, knowing I don't have to beat my body up to be healthy. I can do intense workouts, but I can also enjoy a walk in yoga equally. I can enjoy a paddle board. I can enjoy meditation. I can enjoy those things. Let me be clear. That kind of 
feeling or lifestyle does not mean that I no longer want to be an achiever or hit big goals, mm. right? So the idea of slowing down or doing fewer things has made room for me to do some bigger things better. 2020 was one of my best years in business across the board, even in a pandemic year. It was one of the best. It was the best year for my online coaching team. It was our, we hit the top of the company um, in my online coaching team and the women that I work with. We are one of the top teams across the nation because I feel like I let some other things go and I went deeper on fewer goals. Right. And so I am a, you know, an achiever. I feel good with achievement, but I don't need to do everything. I found a way to do fewer things better. And that fits where I want to be as a more balanced or harmonious, as you said, working mom and woman. So picking the things that you want to be amazing at, I'm never going to say slow down and kick back and, you know, let the goals go, right? You can always justify why you don't hit goals. I don't want to be that person. I want to hit the goal. I want to hit the goal in a more harmonious way. Let me ask you a question that is in regards to that is what if someone hears you, understands you, but feels guilty about, quote, letting go of some of those roles? They just... They, they are high achievers, they have goals, but they also want to take care of themselves, but are not willing to let go of some of those big things, but they know they need to. How do you get out of that? Uh, trust, trust the process. I mean, maybe it's just me telling you that. Todd, as you know, I consulted for some big companies in the industry. I, I presented for some big companies in the industry and I trust that what I was meant to do, I did. And it doesn't all need to carry forward with me. I, I like thinking about my journey as I've done that. I did it well. I enjoyed that. Peace. Peace be with you. I think Move on. People who've been there and done that and are doing it and talk to them. Right. Right. She's been there, done that and doing it, living it uh, on that. I'm always like, find someone that's two or three steps down the lane than you and replicate what they're right. doing. Want to get to another level in your life, whatever that means to you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it worked. I felt like doing fewer things better um, really fit where I want to be in life. And that doesn't mean slacking and that doesn't mean not having goals. Like I've got income goals. I've got business goals. I've got all kinds of goals, but I, I'm not trying to accumulate goals like little pebbles and grab as many as I can. Right. right? That's, that I don't want that. So those, yeah, those are some of the things that I'd share about business parenting and life. Let me ask you another question. This is good. We're talking parenting and business life. I want to talk about joy. I want to talk about happiness, harmony, all the things that we do. Why do we work the way we work? And, you know, when it comes to our teams, our brick and mortar, for you, Trina Gray, yeah. what's bringing you the most joy right now? I love hearing about it. It's so funny. I'm sitting here in my office, Todd, um, on the lake, and I'm looking at my paddleboard. It's, it's uh, leaning up against a pretty birch tree. And that's where I'll be five minutes after I'm done with you, mm -hmm. right? The idea that I had a vision for my life probably in my late twenties, by the time I was 30, um, it's never too late or early to have this vision. My friends listening, I had a vision for my life that included what it looks like right now. I actually remember seeing, I know this sounds funny. I remember seeing in a catalog for the ladies listening, there's a catalog of clothing called Athleta, right? And I was looking through this catalog and I saw this woman in this sundress out on a paddleboard. Now I didn't live on the lake. I didn't have a paddleboard. That wasn't my life, but I looked at this and thought she looks happy. Mm. I, that looks relaxing. That looks adventurous. I want that. So here I am 15 years later about to go paddleboarding on the lake where I live. I had a vision for my life that I was willing to hold on to far before I ever had it mm. far before I ever had it. And so I feel like my work was always taking me toward this I enjoyed the life that I was living while I was building the life that I wanted. And so having that vision, you know, brings me joy. Living on the lake brings me joy and seeing a vision I had for my life brings me joy. Work-wise, what brings me joy is seeing my health club open, getting in, teaching real classes, seeing real people makes me happy, right? Amen. And lastly, um, I coach women all over the country to have their own business online. And as you mentioned earlier in the call, I took 250 women to South or to St. Pete, Florida 
in mid-July for a retreat that was one of the best experiences of my life. And I'd say that because I took a risk and um, invited people to be at an event with me that I felt like we needed. And I thought, will they show up? And they didn't just show up, they showed up with bells on, right? And it was my favorite blend of a fitness business retreat. I've been, as your listeners have been, to all kinds of work conferences over the years. And what I always found was that I, I don't wanna come home burnt out, I don't want to go and just be in this cool city, but only be in, in a conference room. Right. I want to have a combination of business coaching, masterminding. I wanted free time. I wanted fun receptions and social time. I wanted business and learning and laughter and um, workouts. And I put together, in my opinion, the best possible three-day retreat I could create for other women I work with. And it was such a joy that brought me a lot of joy. Who was in that room? What was it? It was all women. It was um, all women who are um, coaches uh, with Beachbody connected to my team. These are women who help people get fit from anywhere. They use Beachbody programs and products and they run their own online businesses. So these are women, lots of moms, really from right out of college to retirees, all different parts of the country. They flew in from the Pacific Northwest, from California, from the East Coast. We all met there and they're looking for more income and more time in financial freedom, right? So they're looking for ways to be, um, to serve in the fitness industry on their time. All right. So we did workouts together. We broke bread together and had dinner together. We had receptions together. We did masterminding, life coaching. We did all kinds of business planning together. Um, so that, that in a sense is a nutshell of who I am. I want to not just coach women in business. I really like enjoy coaching women to be better versions of themselves in life. And that um, business allows me to do that. Trina, I know you have read the book, The Love Languages. The love language I have is words of affirmation. I know you have that as well. When I do a live event, one of the reasons why I do live events, well, I do it for several reasons. One is because that's when I feel like I'm doing my best work, when I'm doing a live event and there's people actually in the room and I'm flowing and going and, and I feel like I can make my best transformations for people live. One of the reasons why I do that is because I love the feedback I receive after a live event because of the transformation that one had in the room and then took it back to their family or their business and things changed. What did one of the ladies say to you after that event in St. Petersburg, Florida? What, like maybe she risked a lot to actually get on a plane, show up and she went oh. there and something happened or, uh, and I know several of the, the women who went to that, uh, could you share a story, if you have one, of a word of affirmation that you received afterwards from one of the women? Oh, I mean, we're, you and I are so, uh, you know, peas in a pod when it comes to this, that, you know, words of affirmation, feeling like you really made a difference in someone's lives is the cup that fills me up, right? So there was a woman there who had never flown, never been away from her kids, never um, been on a business retreat, never been away on her own. And um, the person she was meeting at the airport, unfortunately had uh, transportation issues and missed the flight. Mm -hmm. And this woman took the brave step to still get on from the Pacific Northwest, right? By herself, flew across the country to St. Pete on her own. Her friend didn't make the flight. Okay. She came up to me at the end of it and was like, that was trans formative, showing myself that I could do this, that I belonged here. That was what I heard the most Todd and the hundreds of messages, flowers, people sent, people are so generous and giving flowers, cards in the mail, cards are still coming in the mail almost every day. People will still send me a card in the mail saying, I felt like I belonged. I felt like you made me feel like I mattered. You knew my name. You greeted me. You made me feel important. And those are the things I would say that mattered most to me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I just find that after any event, even a podcast, when you all DM me and tell me, hey, this really resonated. Yeah. I find that a word of affirmation. You only need one for a live event. One experience. Someone says something like that. It's like it made it all worthwhile. The risk yeah. that you put on the line, probably five or six figures that you had to invest to make sure that this thing happened in this crazy time that we're in. You yeah. need one of those experiences from a woman who's traveling from the great Northwest. Uh, I'm sure you had dozens, but I just wanted to know 
what was that one that meant the most and that right there of a woman who'd never <laughs> who had never done that before congratulations on that i know there were a lot of people whose lives were impacted trina last last uh frame where would people find you follow you they want to work with you they want to find out more about you um where can they find you or more about you yeah well todd someday i'll have a book that will share more of my lessons in life. Right and, <laughs> I know, right? And so I always hope that someday people will continue to follow me. So when I do share a book of life, parenting lessons, that's you guys got a real good piece of who I am and what I stand for today. Um, but in the meantime, I really do share a lot of lessons, a lot of thoughts about life on my Instagram. It seems really simple, but it's so accessible and easy. So you can find me on Instagram at Trina Gray, G-R-A-Y, I'd love for you to follow me. These are the kinds of things you'll see. Sunsets, life lessons, parenting lessons, fitness inspiration. Um, and on there, you know, is a link to Team Rockstar Fit is the name of my coaching team, teamrockstarfit.com. You can hit start now, fill out a simple form for me, and I'll set up a one-on-one -on -one with you and see if we're a good fit um, to mentor. And um, yeah, that's where I am. And I'd love to see you. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to have you follow my stories. You'll see behind the scenes of my health club, my house, my, my life. And I would just love meeting new friends in the industry, if nothing else. Yeah. Well, Trina, in a moment, you're going to break us down with any final parting words that you oh, have. Boy. Before you do that, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you because for over 15 years, uh, we have had the opportunity to work together on many different levels. And you have always showed up um, in anything. In our live events that we have, you always show up. You're always there at every meeting, whether that meeting has 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, you're always there. And whether it's to actually serve and, and uh, be one of the speakers or to be in the room, you're always there. And you do an incredible job connecting with people and changing lives. Folks, I've seen it firsthand. Trina Gray has literally changed thousands of lives hundreds of thousands of lives because I know Team Beachbody honored you just a few years ago as their top entrepreneur and leader in the entire company, folks, uh, 300,000 people. But more than all the accolades and achievements, just the woman that you are, I say thank you for showing up in not only the best of times, but the toughest of times. And right now we're in the middle of a, a battle and a fight. And I see you on your Instagram and on your Facebook and at BAC. And what I hear from other colleagues of ours is Trina Gray is always serving and serving and serving. Mm. I want to say thank you for just being here on the, on the podcast today to serve my audience and the people uh, who are following me. Folks, do yourself a favor. I want you to follow Trina Gray. Go to her Instagram and follow her. I'll have all of her information in the show notes. If you're like, hey, I want to follow her. Remember, you can always go back even and get more of Trina Gray. Episode 14, way back in the beginning, episode 14, Grit, Grind, and Dreams. Uh, yeah. Trina made uh, an appearance and, and the whole show is about her. But right now, follow her on that. Trina, can you break us down? Any parting words for our ladies or gentlemen listening in today as they go on with their day? Mm, I love it. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, to my friends and listeners out there, here's what I'd say. I want you, you use the word to my favorite words, Todd. So I'm going to finish with that show up. And here's what I mean. I want you to show up hard wherever you are. If I'm getting on a zoom with two people, I'm showing up hard. If I'm leading a workout with 12 people or 50 people, I'm showing up hard. If I'm sitting down for dinner with my kids, I'm showing up hard. And what I mean by that, it's taking work. I mean that I show up in my life in the way that I want people to see me, right? I show up, I try to bring my best self to the table, whether that is literally the kitchen table or that is the table of mentoring and leading or the class with a headset on. I know it's not always easy, but I really stay committed to showing up hard wherever I am because people deserve your best version of yourself. So that's something I'd say. I feel like when I've shown up hard in life, Todd, doors open that I never predicted, right? Showing up hard, I'll finish with this piece. If you don't know my story, my backstory, I showed up hard in these group fitness classes in this small town of Alpena, Michigan with dirty floors and a boom box and, you know, weights from Walmart and just really yes. old school. When I first moved to town 20 years ago, not knowing a soul in the world, dropped in this new town far from where I grew up, didn't know anybody, had no connections, started serving in a really 
very challenging environment of this recreation center, I brought my best self to the table to serve, not knowing that one of the women in that class was married to the facilities director of our huge local hospital. And she liked me, she liked how I showed up. So when the hospital was looking to expand a huge expansion and add on outpatient cardiac rehab, physical therapy, and put on a wellness unit, who did they contact? This unknown woman, 28 years old, about to have a second baby, not from town, no degree in business. They contacted me, a group fitness instructor, and said, we've heard about you. We like your energy. We like your what you give for people for five bucks a class. What do you think about opening a place here? Now, here I am 15 years later running one of the premier medically based health clubs in the country because I showed up hard without strings attached. Mm, show up. Trina Gray, I talk about this all the time, but who you hang out with, who you associate with, who you listen to, um, it, it rubs off on you. And right now, I don't know about you all, but my chin dropped. I was kind of gritting my teeth a little bit. I'm like, we got this, baby. We can do this. We got it. Just from saying show up. Fit Trina, thank you so much for all of you who are today. Folks, I always say this, but remember, you got to train hard. You got to eat right. You got to live inspired. You must create impact. And today, you better show up. Hey friends, thank you so much for showing up for Todd's Impact Podcast. It was such a pleasure to talk to you about excelling in business, parenting, and self. I hope to get to connect with you on Instagram. I hope you took some golden nuggets and I'm so excited to hear what moved your soul.